And now, please welcome CEO of Illumina, Francis D'Souza, and health and science journalist featured in Wired, Sarah Richards. Genomics, genes, DNA, information, genomes. Genetics. I study DNA. Yeah. I'm cracking the code. I study genomes, genes, and the DNA of people. Genomes, a complete set of genes, genetic material in the cell. Know what I mean? We know 23 pairs of chromosomes are smushed into each cell. Hi, Francis. Hello. It's good to see you again. I had the privilege to hear Francis speak two years ago when I didn't know much about this little company called Illumina. I was blown away as I learned about the power of genetic sequencing to diagnose mysterious genetic diseases in babies in the NICU, to detect the exact mutation of your cancer and improve your odds of successful treatment, and to create a better prenatal test that lets a woman give a blood sample instead of having to undergo an invasive amniocentesis. You said, and I'm proud that I took such good notes, our mission is to improve human health by unlocking the power of the human genome. We're at the very, very beginning of what that impact will be. That was two years ago. So this seems like a good time to check in. What are you excited about now? Sure. This as you said, there's, there's a lot going on in the field of genomics. But as I sit here right now, uh, what I'm most excited about is that it feels like we are on the cusp of genomics truly entering mainstream health uh, across a number of areas, especially if you look at the progress in health systems, in therapies, and in areas like liquid biopsy. In health systems, it was last health conference, actually, where Geisinger announced that they were going to roll out whole exome sequencing as a trial for their patient population. Uh, and that was a breakthrough in health systems. And as we sit here today, we're only a few months away from the NHS in the UK rolling out genomic medicine as a standard of care for the entire population. So 55 million people in the UK over the next year will have access to sequencing uh, to treat genetic diseases and diagnose them, uh, as well as to find the right therapies for cancer. So a really big step forward. And behind the NHS, we're engaged now with over 50 initiatives around the world for population sequencing to really bring genomic medicine to, to the masses. If you look at cell and gene therapies, we've had a huge amount of progress even in the last few weeks. Actually, a few weeks ago, uh, Victoria Gray checked out of the uh, Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Nashville and is the first person in the world to have CRISPR used to treat her debilitating sickle cell anemia. We also have gene and cell therapies after 20 years of a drought emerging for various types of cancer, for SMA, and a number of other previously uncurable diseases. And then finally, we're seeing the emergence of liquid biopsy, which is a blood test where they look for mutations uh, from circulating tumor DNA in the blood. Companies like Gardent are doing a terrific job you know, showing that you can do a blood test as effectively and much more cost effectively than doing biopsies. And for some cancers, like lung cancer, that's a really big step forward. And then companies like Grail are showing great results in using a blood test to detect early stage cancer, which could be truly transformative in the field. So lots going on, but those are the things I'm most excited about. Awesome. So since hearing you speak, I became a lot more interested in genomics, and I've been writing about it. And I'm always struck that there's such a huge gap between all the great work that's being done in the field, as you mentioned, and what the public actually knows. Why do you think there's such a disconnect, and what do you think needs to be done to bridge it? I think it's been a truism in genomics that the pace of innovation far outstrips the pace of education. Uh, and what I mean by that is that it's really hard, even for practitioners in the field, to keep up with everything that's going on. If we look at what's just happened in the last month, you know, we talked about Victoria Gray. Uh, there are doctors in Boston that are getting ready to uh, use gene therapy to address a form of inherited blindness in a patient. Uh, we've had discoveries of new gene risk factors for schizophrenia. Uh, researchers have un uncovered a DNA methylation signature tied to aging and autism. And so the field is continually moving forward really quickly. 
And if you look at where we are with the medical profession, it's really hard for doctors to keep up with what's going on. If you think about in the US, the average age of a physician is just over 51 years old. And you know, three quarters of doctors went to medical school before the first human genome was even sequenced. Uh, there was an interesting study done in 2016 for students graduating from a medical school, and 94% of them said that they did not feel equipped to deal with precision medicine. And so we have this gap between you know, truly breakthrough uh, discoveries happening and our ability to, to, to get people up to speed. And so we're deeply engaged in trying to move the field forward. Uh, we're partnering to educate the masses, and we're doing a, a partnership with, for example, Discovery Channel uh, to put genomics curriculum that can be freely accessed by schools, and we have about 150,000 people, uh, students download that so far. But it's also by being engaged in continuing education programs and, and, and professional guidelines and societies to help move that field forward. And genomics is just always a hot topic, so it's, always it's a hot exciting topic. for new generations. All right, the theme of HLTH is to create health's future. How will Illumina and genomics change our futures in a few years and maybe even five to 10 years from now? You know, as you said, our mission is to improve human health by unlocking the power of the genome. And so what we are relentlessly focused in moving sort of all the levers we can to, to get genomics more widespread adoption. Uh, part of that includes a lot of innovation around technology to bring the price of sequencing down. Um, and, and I think if we look out over the next five to 10 years, you know, we'll see genomics have profound uh, impact in the health system in two ways. Um, I think the genome will be a fundamental element of all of our health records and will help us think about risk and predisposition as well as treatment. On the risk side, I think everybody here is familiar with the idea that, look, there are mutations in genes like BRCA that significantly increase a person's risk factors for getting genetic disease. And yet, they're not commonly done as tests. In addition, you know, we're now finding that polygenic risk scores can also be used to, to talk about a person's predisposition risk to things like cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, obesity. And so I think if you play this out five to 10 years, you know, we'll start to look at those polygenic risk scores and use it to inform both lifestyle choices, but also interventions, like how often you get screened, when you get screened. And then if you think about therapies, I think, again, the genome will be very important in prescribing therapies. Even today, with the knowledge we have, we know that 95% of people, so 95% of you, have a, a common mutation that means that you would either not benefit from or have an adverse drug reaction to common medications like anti-blood clot medication or certain types of anesthesia. Uh, and so, you know, we look at what's happening in the healthcare system where we have about $30 billion a year in the US spent on adverse drug reactions. And a third of that spend could be avoided if we knew gene-drug interactions. And so you play this out five years, I think everybody will know their pharmacogenomic profile, and it'll be used to diagnose and, and, and pick treatments for that diagnosis. And I think that'll be a foundational thing. Awesome. This is a good segue. We hear a lot about how the price is coming down. And this summer, the company Veritas announced you can get your whole genome sequenced for $600. And you've spoken about someday reaching the $100 milestone. So give us an update. Sure. Uh, as I said, one of the things we are focused on is driving that cost of sequencing down. And, and if you look back from 2006 till today, we've driven the cost of sequencing a genome down by a factor of 500. So around 2005, six, it was $4 million a genome. Uh, after we released our, our genome analyzer, you know, we brought it down to $150,000. In 2014, we announced the $1,000 genome, and today you can get it for $600. Uh, we have a lot uh, in terms of innovation internally. We spend about 18% of our revenue on R&D, about twice the industry average. And so we have a lot going on in terms of research and technology to drive the cost of the genome down, because we believe in the fundamental elasticity of this market, that as we bring it down, you know, we will get broader adoption option. But we're also focused in the rest of the ecosystem that's necessary for broad adoption. And what we know is that in the healthcare system, it's not just the price of a test, but it's engaging with the pairs around clinical utility, 
It's engaging with the professional societies around guidelines. Um, and even after you've got guidelines and reimbursement, it's about educating the physicians about when to get the test uh, and, and what to do with the results. And so we're engaged with all those elements of the ecosystem as well. Awesome. Let's talk a little more about diagnosing genetic diseases for sick children, which I know you've made a priority under your leadership. Why is getting a diagnosis so important for these families? Probably the best way for me to, to start to answer that question is talk about uh, you know, a girl called Ellis and, and sort of how her story played out. And you know, Ellis, uh, when she was 16 months old, uh, she got an infection that she couldn't really recover from, and she started getting weaker and weaker. And so at 19 months, her mother took her to a neurologist. And, and the neurologist said, you know, just watch her, it'll probably go away. But it didn't, and she kept getting weaker. At 20 months, she went to another neurologist who misdiagnosed her with Guillain-Barre syndrome and put her on medications that didn't do anything. And then finally, at 25 months, her mother saw somebody on TV, actually on Good Morning America, that looked like she had the same symptoms as her daughter. And that woman was diagnosed using genomic sequencing. And so her mother went in and demanded she get sequencing. And they sequenced her and they actually did get a diagnosis. And it turned out that the girl had a riboflavin transport disorder, type two. And what she needed was a vitamin B supplement, high doses of vitamin B supplements, so not a very expensive intervention. And so they started giving it to her and it prevented further developmental degeneration. But if they'd given her that at 16 months, not at 25 months, when she first started showing the symptoms, you know, she'd be able to walk today. You know, if they'd given it to her at 16 months, she'd be able to use her hands today. She'd be able to swallow without a breathing tube, all of which she can't do today. And so that's the fierce urgency we feel around genetic diseases. First of all, people think these are rare genetic diseases, but it impacts about 250 million people around the world. For those people today, they go on average of a diagnostic odyssey of seven to nine years. They're typically misdiagnosed two to three times. 10% of the families go bankrupt because of the costs associated with doing that. And yet we know today that if you do a whole genome sequence of the trio, in some cases you get diagnostic yields of up to 50 plus percent off those patients. And sometimes the interventions are there. It could be a vitamin B supplement like the case of Ellis. In some cases it's about the peace of mind of knowing you have a diagnosis, being able to access services, uh, and, and being able to find a community around, around the, the, the condition. And so that's the urgency we feel around, you know, genetic diseases is something we can move on today. Yeah. I interviewed that mother for an article for the Washington Post, and the crazy part about it is, aren't the vitamin D supplements ridiculously cheap? 40 cents a day. Something so easy that could have been fixed. Yeah. That's crazy. So with any innovation, it's always a question of who gets access to it. I recently had the honor to write a 7,000 word article for Wired Magazine about a luminous head scientist, Ryan Taft, and his efforts to increase access to whole genome sequencing to diagnose desperately sick children in the nation's NICUs. NICUs. And he told me something that always sticks with me. He said, I just can't stand that this technology exists and it's not getting to the kids who need it. Has access improved? You know, we've made progress um, in some areas. And so I'll talk about an area we've made progress, for example. Um, we've made progress in moving reimbursement. And so this is one of those rare stories where the pairs have actually moved very quickly. And so if you go back to 2014-15, there was almost no reimbursement for whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing for children with genetic diseases. And we engaged with the pairs, and the economic case is so compelling here that very quickly we're now at a state where we have over 150 million people that have access to whole genome, whole exome sequencing, you know, if their child has a genetic disease. So the pairs moved really quickly, and so one of the, one of the pair success stories here. Where we haven't made as much progress is in utilization. And what I mean by that is, today in the US there are about 250,000 children that have this condition and have access to reimbursement, so they are covered. But if you look at, over the last 12 months, how many actually got the test, it's under 2,000. So less than 1% of the kids who are sick and have 
insurance actually got the test. And so we've partnered with Blue Cross Blue Shield to do a study to understand what's the utilization of this test. And, and what we found is that there are these big genomic deserts, if you like, where doctors don't know enough to, die, to prescribe the test, and they're concerned that if they do, they don't know how to interpret the results. And there's more work to be done around, around driving utilization of the test. So good progress in terms of you know, diagnostic yields, good progress in terms of getting insurance on board, uh, but more work to do to get utilization of the test up. All right. So let's talk globally. Ryan Taft also envisioned a world in which a doctor of a dying child in rural Ghana would simply need an international shipping label to send a vial of the patient's blood to centers of excellence around the world for sequencing. What is Illumina doing to make sequencing available to more people in more places? Yeah, Ryan, and, and frankly, everybody who works at Illumina is truly passionate about making sure that genomic testing is, is accessible to everyone. Part of that is the core work we do around driving the cost of sequencing down. Uh, we believe that's going to be essential to make sure that this test is adopted everywhere around the world. Uh, part of it is in putting together end-to-end -end solutions and creating cleared products with, with easy-to-use reporting so that people can use it around the world, not just in the specialized genome centers. Uh, we're also working around education, and we're also working to educate people who serve the underrepresented communities. So for example, we're working with the American Cancer Society to incorporate genomics training for uh, patient ambassadors, you know, patient guides, as well as people who are answering the phones at the National Cancer Information uh, Network because they typically serve underserved communities. In addition to that, we've launched a, a philanthropy program called iHope. And the idea here is that for people who don't have coverage, you know, we will underwrite the cost of doing the, the, the genome sequencing so that they can get an answer. That's a program we launched. It's, it's small and growing, and we're recruiting a network of, of healthcare providers to work with us on the IHOPE program so that, you know, we can make genomic testing accessible to everyone. Awesome. All right, to close, I'll use a trick that I learned in journalism school that would help us figure out the focus of an article. If I run into an old friend at the welcome party and say, oh my gosh, I just heard Francis D'Souza speak, you'll never believe what they're doing at Illumina these days. How should I finish the sentence? Well, a lot of people think that genomics is something that's going to impact us five or ten years away. So the way I'd answer the question is say, look, you know, genomics is happening today. Our customers today sequence a whole genome equivalent, uh, you know, uh, twice a minute every day for the full year. And so we're seeing a lot of genomes being done today and impacting patients' lives today. Thank you. Awesome, thank you.